Hello everyone and welcome to MedTube again. And today's topic is about sepsis and septic shock. Now sepsis is actually the leading cause of death in non-coronary intensive care unit settings and that's because sepsis leads to multi-organ failure. So it is a very serious clinical condition. Now sepsis is a clinical syndrome that complicates severe infection. In other words, sepsis is actually a continuum of dysregulated inflammation that starts as the following. It starts first as SIRS, which is a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which goes to sepsis and then to severe sepsis, and finally it ends up in septic shock. What happens in SIRS is that first you actually have a local inflammation because of the bacterial toxins and antigens, of course, which trigger the release of the pro-inflammatory cytokines from the immune system. However, the problem is actually in the immune system, which releases the inflammatory cytokines in an exaggerated way and unregulated way. And this results in the traveling of those inflammatory cytokines to the rest of the body, distant from the site of the inflammation, and this results in systemic inflammation and systemic vasodilation as if the same signs of the local inflammation are present in all of the body and this is what causes the hypotension and all of the other sequelae of sepsis. Now SIRS is defined clinically as the following two or more of one body temperature of more than 38.5 degrees Celsius or less than 36 and some people say it's 35. 2. A heart rate of more than 90 beats per minute and 3. A respiratory rate of more than 20 breaths per minute or a PaCO2 of less than 32 millimeters of mercury which actually means tachypnea because of the increased elimination of the arterial carbon dioxide concentration and finally a WBC count of less than 4,000 cells per milliliter which is leukopenia or more than 12,000 cells per milliliter which is leukocytosis or more than 10% bands. So now we have two or more of those four criteria, SIRS then can be diagnosed. Now if we discover a source of infection, then the SIRS will then be called sepsis. So sepsis is SIRS plus a proven or probable source of infection. So for example, you discover a pneumonia or you discover an abscess and so forth. And it's also important to mention that the causative organism is only identified in 50 to 70 percent of patients. And when that organism is identified, it is most commonly a gram positive bacteria, and then the gram negative bacteria follows, and then the fungi. So those are the three most common causes of sepsis when discovered. Now, if we have a sepsis, with signs of end organ dysfunction, then we have a condition called severe sepsis. And examples of end organ dysfunction include the following. First is hypotension with a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or a mean arterial pressure of less than 70 before adequate fluid resuscitation. And we'll see shortly why this is very important. So you have to have a hypotension before you have completely administered your fluid resuscitation. A second example of endocrine dysfunction is hyperlactatemia, which also indicates vasodilation and hypoperfusion of tissues. And then we have acute oliguria with a urine output of less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. And then we have acute lung injury with a ratio of less than 250 of arterial oxygen tension to the fraction of inspired oxygen, which of course indicates hypoxemia. And then we have creatinine of more than 2 mg per deciliter, which indicates kidney hypoperfusion. And then we have a bilirubin of more than 4 mg per deciliter, which indicates liver dysfunction. And then we have a thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of less than 100,000, which indicates that inflammation is targeting the platelets and that platelets are being consumed by the ongoing endothelial dysfunction. And finally, we have an INR of more than 1.5, which indicates ongoing activation of the complement, the coagulation, and the fibrinolytic systems simultaneously. So those are some of the examples of end organ dysfunction, which are required to diagnose a severe sepsis. Now, finally, if we have a severe sepsis with hypotension, despite adequate fluid resuscitation, then we have a septic shock. So again, to diagnose septic shock, we need the criteria for severe sepsis plus hypotension 
non-responsive to the fluid resuscitation. And adequate fluid resuscitation is defined as infusion of 30 milliliters per kilogram of crystalloids. And now coming to the treatment of severe sepsis and septic shock. And we have three main things which we should perform. The first step is to stabilize the respiration. And that's by ensuring supplemental oxygen with or without mechanical ventilation. The second thing which is very important is to restore the perfusion. And that's by usually inserting a central venous catheter for the administration of the fluids and medications if required. And also for monitoring CVP which is the central venous pressure and the SCVO2 which is the central venous oxygen saturation. And afterwards we will start the fluid resuscitation. However, if the patient is still not responsive to the fluid resuscitation that is the patient is still symptomatic and signs of end organ dysfunction are still present then we would go for IV vasopressors such as phenylephrine and norepinephrine and if it's still not working then a third line would be an IV inotrope such as dobutamine or even RBC transfusion now finally a very very important step in restoring perfusion is that fluid resuscitation must be done according to the early goal directed therapy targets which should be fulfilled within six hours of the presentation of your patient in order to prevent or limit the multiple organ failure and those targets are the following first is to achieve a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury or more two is to achieve a urine output of 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour or more and three is to achieve a central venous pressure of 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury and we measure it using the central venous catheter and finally we have to achieve an SCVO2 of 70% or more or an SVO2 of 65% or more and there is one more criteria which is the trending down of lactate but it's not easily done on bedside now not all of those criteria are necessarily measured in every patient but usually the urine output and the mean arterial pressure are the usual criteria to follow and lastly but not least is to administer the antibiotics as we have mentioned in our previous lecture and of course we should first collect a blood sample so that the blood culture is not compromised by the antibiotics so stabilize respiration restore the perfusion and give antibiotics this is all for this lecture which aims to give a quick summary on sepsis and septic shock thank you very much for watching and please watch our next video on fluid balance and resuscitation